Okay. Hey, everybody. Hi. <laughs> so um, I'm Linda Raftree, and um, I work on a couple of things. I work on uh, the intersection of technology and community, mobil community mobilization, community development. And then I also work on trying to change some of the stereotypical narratives that people in the development community like to tell about um, people that they work with, especially when they're trying to do fundraising. Um, so there's this great story I saw in The Onion. Um, I shouldn't have told you it was The Onion. But um, this great story about this really inspiring project. Um, Dallas area parents Robert and Alice Livingston were absolutely crushed when doctors informed them that their infant son had been born with a rare, possibly fatal heart condition. As the couple worried every night over their sick three-week-old son, Bradley, the hospital staff began to formulate a plan. Hoping to do something thoughtful for the anxious couple, these doctors were able to use a 3D printer to make the family a new electric guitar. That's right, the amazing labor and delivery team at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital came together in the Livingston's time of need to surprise them with a finely detailed 3D printed musical instruments. They weren't eating, they were hardly sleeping, they were so stressed about, about their baby boy. It was worth 3D printing such an awesome guitar just to see the looks on their faces. I'm so happy we were able to do this for Robert and Alice. The guitar is really extraordinary. The 3D printed axe has a fretted neck and genuine working tuning knobs. They can rest a little easier now that they know they have a 3D guitar. So um, that's kind of not what we want to do. I think we want to do things like print 3D hands, right? Um, with 3D printers, not print guitars that aren't really useful um, for the issue. And this is another um, photo that I really love because you can't see it very well, but they might as well be, um, you know, models standing next to a beer can. Um, they might as well be fondling a, a new car. Um, they're not using the computer. The computer is not turned on. It's not even facing them. Um, so I feel like a lot of what we sometimes do when we're talking about how to support people with technology is we really fetishize both the people and the technology, and um, we're not always necessarily listening to the people that, um, that we want to be working with and, and supporting. So I care a lot about that. I work a lot on that. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about community development and technology. Um, and I think the thing that makes my talk a little bit easier is that we heard amazing examples of how to do it right this morning. We heard about talking with communities. We heard yesterday about the importance of listening. Um, so I'm going to give you five tips to avoid inspiring yet useless efforts um, when you're working with communities um, and development and technology. So I think the first, um, the first question, or the first thing to, th to do to think about is really to understand the context and understand where you're working. And that isn't only applicable in context in the quote unquote developing world. Um, we saw with the example of Enable today, really understanding the, com the context of someone who's born without an, a working um, hand and really understanding what that, what that problem feels like, what it looks like for families, what it looks like for people who are facing that challenge, and then how to really work together with them to create something that, um, that is useful. Um, so when you're talking about using communications, um, information and communication technology, the first thing to really think about is how do people already communicate and share information. And um, a lot of times, that's, uh, if you're working in rural communities, it's maybe in body language, as we've heard a lot about. Um, maybe it's writing, maybe it's posters. Um, so it's really important to understand that before you start introducing something else. How do people cope with challenges? Um, this is a, a photo of a community in rural Senegal, and there was only one house in the community that had electricity because someone had stolen the solar panels. And so everyone was charging their phone at the house where um, there was this one lady that had the electricity. Um, so people found a way to charge their phones, but it wasn't maybe the way you would think um, if you were coming from the outside and trying to work with, uh, with people on a project that was using mobile. Um, the role of culture and tradition is really important. These are two girls. They're both from Kenya. 
but they have very different lifestyles. One is from urban Kenya, one is from rural Kenya. Um, and so they're going to have very different experiences and very different ways of um, seeing the world because they're from two different places, even though they're within the same country. And that works everywhere around the world. Um, you can't sort of put people because they're maybe poor or they're from a community or they're from Africa or even a country in Africa or even a region um, in a country in Africa. You really need to understand um, all those nuances. And then which people use which technology. So I, when I was working in Mozambique one time, I had all the kids that we were working with put their phones on the tables just so we could really see what kind of phones they had. Some of them, very few of them had phones that were data enabled, um, but they didn't really know how to make the data work. Um, most of them had very simple feature phones. So again, it was about understanding that out of the 20 kids, these were the phones that they had available to them. A lot of them borrowed phones. Um, and so really understanding how do people communicate, which tools they're using, um, and what they have access to, and when they have access to it. Um, we've also talked with, a couple months ago, I was in Indonesia, and we were working with girls trying to figure out what their access was to mobile. Um, and most of them borrowed phones, and they would tell us things like, well, you know, we really want to look such and such thing up because they had data-enabled phones, but we're borrowing phones, so we feel bad about taking someone's phone for, for too long. So we just, you know, snatch the phone, we do something really fast, and we give it back. So when you're designing something, you have to really understand what is, what is the communication um, pattern, or how do people really access information, and then how do you think about designing something, asking them the right questions, and figuring out how you could actually use something on a phone that someone only has access to for you know, two or three minutes at a time. The other um, tip, I would say, is building on what's already there. Um, we heard a lot about that this morning as well. So what existing organizations are there in the community? And these are um, students. We worked a lot through student groups because it didn't really make sense for um, when we were working with, with young people to go in and sort of try to start a new group. If there's already an existing network, an existing infrastructure of student organizations, let's work through them. Uh, what projects and programs are already happening in the community? Rather than coming in again and starting your own thing with your own methodology, a lot of times there are methods that are working. They're just poorly resourced, or they don't maybe have the tools um, in order to take things forward. So really thinking through um, how you can support what's already happening. It might need tweaking. It might need improvement. But that's doing it together with the community to figure that tweaking and that improvement out. Um, local organizations, this is Kenneth and Timothy that we were working with in Cameroon. They had this great. Um, media organization, but they weren't using newer technology. They were using more traditional technology. And they were really excited about being able to learn about some new things that they could incorporate into their existing work. Um, it's another great way to build on what's there. Um, this is Judith. She started off as a project officer. She was really excited about um, using technology. And she's now gone from being a project officer to being a program manager, to being a grants manager, to moving from Cameroon to um, an office in Liberia and managing grants there. So really, um, I think also when you're trying to build on what's there, it's finding people who are already excited and interested and looking to advance and to learn. And you can really support them through giving them opportunities to participate and to work on different projects. And this is Peter. He's in Kenya. Um, he just sent me a Skype message that, um, that he's signed up for a master's degree um, at a long-distance university in Uganda. Um, and so again, finding people who are very capable. He's an amazing technologist. He works in Kalifi. Um, and he's supported us so much on all of our projects. And he's someone who's there in the community that you can really support and, um, and help to advance and build up with his own aspirations. And local government, a lot of people hate talking about local government. They think government is bureaucratic, government is slow. Um, you try to avoid government, that's why we have technology, right? Um, <laughs> but government is actually quite important in a lot of places. And this is a team we worked with um, in Kenya that was trying to digitize the birth registration process. You can't do something like that that's going to have a huge impact without involving government um, in some ways. So, these guys were super engaged, super involved, and they really wanted to be a part of it. So again, building on people, building on things that already exist is really important. And then on the other side, some people hate the private sector um, as much as they hate the government. Um, so the private sector, especially if you're talking about using mobile, they're everywhere. And while I was driving around in, um, in Ghana, every other house was either yellow or red because Vodafone was advertising red and people needed to paint their houses. 
and MTN was advertising yellow, and people also needed to paint their houses. So I was like, what are all these yellow and red houses? It was crazy. Um, and they were all advertising for Vodafone and, and MTN. Um, so just thinking through what are, what are the things that the private sector is trying to do, and how can they help you to scale out something that you're trying to work on at community level, um, because that might be more feasible than trying to um, do it all yourself. And then I think a really important thing for me um, is who's not at the table. Um, talk about that a lot um, when you're working with communities that are normally marginalized, communities that aren't included in decision making. Um, are you mainly listening to men? So this was a community, an elected official. Um, the guy with the, with the hat was a traditional community council member. And this was a project we worked on in Cameroon um, where women were not allowed to be part of any of the traditional councils. Um, through the course of the project and through some of the advocacy that the young women did in the community, they were able to advocate and get some women onto these councils. But normally it's men who are making the decisions. Um, so even though you're building on what's already there, you already also need to be thinking about who's not there within these structures um, that you're working with and making sure that you have alternative ways of including um, women, young people, et cetera. These are the young people we worked with on one of our projects. Um, they were so energetic and so excited about learning um, and expanding things out. And this is you know, both the present as well as the future. And so I think working with young people is also really important. And a lot of times, they're not involved and they're not engaged in decision making at community level because they're seen as not, um, not mature enough to have a voice. And so tapping into young people is also really important. Um, and then women. Um, women and girls are often left out but a lot of times when we talk with people, we're talking with the wealthier people within a community. And so also, again, that idea that communities are not homogenous, they're not all the same because they come from a particular small village. Um, within that village, you have all levels of economic um, access, you have levels of marginalization for all sorts of reasons, whether it's ethnic, whether it's because someone has a disability, whether it's because they're you know, not in school or they're in school. So all these things, and really thinking about what are, who are all these other groups that, that might be in most in need of a particular effort that aren't at the table, that aren't involved in decision making, and really make sure that you're thinking about how to include them. And that sometimes costs money and time and effort, um, but it's something we need to see, keep thinking about. Um, are you meeting a real need, and whose need? Was it you that decided, coming from the outside, or your donor that decided this is what people need, or are you really talking with communities, um, asking people, all these people I talked about, those who are at the table, those who aren't at the table, are you talking with them about what the need is, um, and how you might come up with a solution, and whether or not that solution involves technology at all. Um, if it does, is it affordable, um, both for your organization, if you're just starting something out, but also to people at community level, um, and I think Sometimes it's good to have um, something that costs something, even if it's a small amount, um, because you also don't want to be just kind of going around handing things out to people all the time and creating dependency. But it needs to be affordable, or you need to find a way to make it affordable for people. Um, and really, what happens when the funding ends? Um, I think a lot of us think about that in the last six months or the last three months of a project. Suddenly, it's like, oh, how do we keep this going? Um, oh, yeah, the community is going to take it on, or come up with these you know, ideas that don't usually work. So really thinking from the very beginning of your program or your project, together with the community, what are you going to do when the funding runs out and how is this effort, if it's worthwhile, going to sustain itself? And then I think lastly, it's um, trying, failing, and learning together. Um, we talked a lot about failure now um, as this cool, hip thing. It's really great to fail and to talk about failing. Um, but it's not cool if you're just failing. It's, <laughs> it's kind of cool if you're failing and then learning from it. So. Um, and that's not just you. Um, are you talking with the community about what's failing? Are they engaged and involved? And are they telling you what's going wrong and what's going right? And are they kind of owning it? So I think that's really important. Um, and I love this picture. Just again, these were young people that we were working with to do digital mapping of water sources. And then they were going back and checking in on these water sources to see if they were contaminated, if people were using them. They were mapping it out. And then they were taking all that information and using it to advocate with their local authorities to get funding for improved water systems. Um, and they were very much owning the project because the problem really affected them. OK. 
Um, are you checking in regularly? And that's not just you checking in with people who might be working in another place, but people working in the other place checking in with community members and with people about how the project's going. Um, collecting data on that project, figuring out how people feel about it, but not just collecting it all and sending it up. Um, we heard someone talk about extractive data earlier. Earlier, I think it was um, it was Merrick. Um, really, what are you doing with that information that you're getting back, and how is how are you making sure your organization is able to make changes? Um, a lot of times, we get locked into you know five-year programs and projects, and we feel like we have to deliver this thing when actually the project has gone over here because we're actually listening to people who are saying the project needs to go over here. How can you make your organization adapt to that? And then who decides what success looks like? Um, you might have an idea of what success looks like in your organization, in your grant proposal, in your project plan, but is that the same way that the community is defining success? Um, because if you have two divergent ideas about what success looks like, you're probably going to be working towards different goals and aims. So how can you really harmonize that? Um, and then, very lastly, was there an impact? And we, I see this a lot with technology. People track impact on whether something was downloaded a lot or whether that was clicked on a lot or a lot of people liked it or we distributed this thing to a million people. If you gave SMS to a million people, how many people actually opened it? How many people actually read it? How many people actually did something about the thing that you told them? So you have to go way beyond this sort of just, oh, people clicked on it or people, you know, we sent it out. Um, so that's really important. There's a great guide that Plan International has done around community, um, community ICT but um, the link is at the bottom of it, and I can, I can post it up on Twitter. But it's a great guide to sort of think through how to go through all these different issues um, when you're doing community development work with technology. So in conclusion, five things to think about. I'm not going to read them out. I'll let you guys just do them. And um, don't make 3D guitars for grieving families of ill children, I guess, is, is the main point, right? So thanks. <laughs>